Hallelujah. Of course, he, he knows what we, we pray even before the word is on our tongue. But nevertheless, it's, he longs to hear us voice back to him um, those things that are on our heart. And that's what prayer is all about. It's communicating with God. When we read the word, he um, communicates to us. And when we pray, we communicate back to him. Prayer is a dialogue in that sense. There's many things we've talked about before. It is petitioning. It's pleading, it's, it's talking to God, it's blessing the Lord and blessing others through prayer. Last week, I'm going to pick up where we left off. If you could turn to, Matthew, to uh, Luke chapter 11. And last week, we went through the whole, what's called the Lord's model of praying. Um, and we went through the whole, uh, at least not an exhaustive teaching at all, on what's called the Lord's prayer or the, or the Lord's model of praying, I like to call it, in Matthew 11. Uh, that was on you know, verses 2 to 4. But I want to pick up after that because then he gives examples because we, uh, this is like a two-part series in a sense of last week, the Lord's model of praying and then now some examples he gives. You know, after he says, I'm just going to take it from verse two, but I'm going to start teaching from verse five. But verse two says, and he said to them, when you pray, and this was in response to verse one, where it says, Lord, teach us to pray. So that's exactly what he's doing. He's teaching them to pray. So he's not praying right now. He's teaching them to pray. So it's a model of praying. So when you pray, do this. Say, our Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day your daily bread, our daily bread. And, and forgive us our sins, as we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. And verse 5 says, and then he said to them, and now, now he gives examples. He gives a teaching, and like a, like a good teacher, he gives, the, he gives uh, illustrations. So he gives the teaching and now illustrations. Uh, and he said to them, Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, Though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impertinence, his persistence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. Here's the teaching. And I tell you, so here's a, you know, when Jesus says, yeah, I tell you the truth, or I tell you, it's time to, to really prick up your ears here. And so he says, I tell you, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Very interesting. I mean, he's even asking the answering of prayer in, in even connotation with the Holy Spirit. But this is persistency. It's absolutely necessary in prayer. Uh, just in a side note, it's not on the overhead here, but in a side note, if you look at when Jesus does pray, in John 17, if you want to model, if you really want to see Jesus praying, John 17 is Jesus praying in Gethsemane. That, that's the Lord praying. And, and John, who, who was there but was asleep, uh, was anointed by the Spirit and was, was taught by the Holy Spirit to write down in Holy Writ what Jesus prayed that night when he was in the garden. And by the way, it says that he went back to wake up his disciples. And the Scripture says he went back and prayed the same thing again. And then he went back and woke up his disciples again. You know, it's this thing that, you know, people have asked me time and time again, Kurt, you know, don't you just ask and trust God and then and you have to keep on asking and asking? And sometimes you do. And that is, that is scriptural. Jesus did that. He asked again. And also the Greek in here, in, in, in Matthew, uh, in Matthew, this is Matthew chapter 6, but also Luke chapter 11, the Greek definitely implies a continuation in other words, keep asking and it shall be given. Keep knocking, it shall be given to you. Keep seeking and you shall find. So there definitely is that persistence in prayer. 
And I would, I would say that, you know, the first thing is the key to successful praying is consistency and persistency. To be precise in your praying, I said this last week, you know, when we say forgive us of our sins, be very specific when you say that. Don't just say, okay, Jesus, forgive me of my sins, amen, and go on. Take time and actually do an inventory of your life. And, and then count the sins and say, God, forgive me of this, forgive me of that, forgive me of my pride, forgive me of my impatience that day, forgive me of what I said to this person, and be specific in your praying. You know, you don't have to have a megaphone, and, you know, it's, it's between you and the Lord, but be specific. And then God will ask you specifically. So if I, you know, if, if I need finances for something, I just say, okay, God, I just need some money, thank you. No, I said, God, I need money for this. I need this, this, you know, I guess this, this bill had just come in. Lord, I need this right now, Lord. Or health-wise, or finances. But be very specific in your praying. Pinpointed. Very pinpointed. It's almost like, a, you know, an arrow or a gun. I mean, aim for the target. What you, what you want God to, to answer. What you need God to answer. Because that's another thing. It's, it's not only that, that consistency and persistency, but it's followed by an urgency and a boldness. You know, this, this man that knocked upon the door. When he knocked upon the door, he said, you know, I have visitors here. I, I can't go back empty-handed. I need three loaves. I cannot go back. It's, it's an urgency. And I, I would encourage all of us that, you know, in our praying, yes, the, again, as I, I think it was the first part of this uh, seminar, going back weeks ago now, part one, I, I broke down sort of like the, the different doors of prayer. There are general praying that, you know, I don't have to have an urgency if I'm asking God to bless the food, you know, or just, you know, whatever. Um, you know, that's, the, that's a prayer. God, Lord, bless this food, or I pray for this, and, you know, now will lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. I don't need a deep urgency for that. But other things I do need an urgency for, you know, uh, for, the, for, for the health and welfare of my family, of myself, for just certain things that are going on in my life and, and the life of the church, I mean, you don't have to be a pastor to have a concern for your church. We should all have a concern for that. And for our neighbors, for our family, blood family and also spiritual family, an urgency, a boldness too. And we're going to look at that even closer um, with the boldness. And uh, again, I'm going to talk a little bit tonight on supplication and intercession because we're now moving into more specific types of praying um, now in our fifth week here. But it has to be, that urgency has to be there. And friends, let me just tell you, and it's just on my, my heart as I was praying this, as I was, had a busy day, just came in from the West End, but praying on the train, praying for tonight's meeting. And, you know, this country's going through a lot right now. But we have to have an urgency in our praying. It doesn't matter what party you belong in. Pray for the elections. Pray for the few that are going to govern over the millions. Again, I don't care what your, what your party affiliation is. It doesn't make a difference. Pray, as a matter of fact, we are commanded to pray for the leaders of our country. And right now, we, it needs it desperately urgently, with boldness. We need that. Uh, you know, with it, and prayer must be sincere and honest and wholehearted. So it's not just a flippant little prayer that, you know, are really going to move the heart of God. You know? I mean, again, it's not a matter of loss of salvation, God loving you, this or that. No, it's just, you know, it's not going to move the heart of God. When, you, when, you, when your prayers are, are consistent and persistent, and they're, they're urgent, and they're bold. And you know, you know, it says that we can go bold. We're going to see the scripture later on tonight. We can go boldly into the throne of grace to receive mercy in the time of need. And crying out for mercy for others. We can go with boldness. Which, you know, people who do not know God cannot do that. People who, don't, who care less don't do that. But we, we know God. We have the Spirit living within us. That's what's amazing how Matthew 11 ends that way. He'll give you the Holy Spirit for those who ask. It's amazing. How much more would your Heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit? And we know in Romans that the Holy Spirit will direct our prayer. You know, when you get into a place and you're praying in this way, God is all over it. The Holy Spirit is there just, just, just supporting you, uh, uh, urging you to go on deeper. It's an old expression, you know, we used to know before I was a saber, it's the, the, the deeper you go, the higher you fly. That, you know, if you know, or, do it more of agriculturally. The deeper the roots go in the tree, the taller it grows. Someone said to me, and again, I read this, I'm not a, a tree person. Anyway, but uh, basically how high the tree is is basically how far the roots go. It's almost like it's the balance. 
So if the tree is huge, then the roots go way down. Like anyway, coming from the States, you see these incredible trees, these redwood trees like in, in Oregon and Washington even have roads that go through them, massive trees. Well, those roots are probably massive that go down the whole those things. Same thing with prayer. The higher you want to go with God, the, 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 the deeper, the, the more urgent and the more um, need there is in your life, the, the deeper you need to go into prayer. And that's a sacrifice. There's no doubt about it. Matter of fact, the man, and it's, it's, it's humbling. The man that needed the three loaves. It's humbling to go to your neighbor and say, you know, I, I, I don't have it. You know, I, I need three loaves. And we humble ourselves before the Lord. And these things, we, we get ingrained in our, in our Christian thinking, and it's good. I mean, you know, he's God, we're not. I mean, humble ourselves. I mean, even know that humble yourself before the Lord. He will exalt you. But to really humble yourself before the Lord, go, go before him with repentance, with humility. And say, God, you know, I need this. You know, my, 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 my business is this way. My health is this way. My friend is this way. You know, I see, you know, my mind is this way. God, I need you. I need you. And God, would, God answers those prayers. Um, here's the, the verse that we had. Let me ask you, friends, using this as an example, what are your three loaves? What do you, uh, again, you may have more than three loaves, maybe you have thought in these terms. Tonight, I want you to even go home tonight or maybe this week. And use this as, because Jesus uses as an example. He taught, this is the way you pray. Then he gave the examples. A man had three, I need three loaves. I mean, I'll just throw this out to you just as, as I challenge you. What are three things that you, can, you, you need God to move in your life on? I mean, don't, I say this rhetorically, don't yell them out. Think about it. What are three loaves that you need right now? And you're not leaving God. God, I'm not going to leave until you give me the three loaves. I need it, God. Maybe it's finances. Maybe it's health. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's relationships. Could be something. What, what are the three loaves that you can ask God for tonight? I need three loaves. And you might have heard a no from this before. And sometimes God answers with no, and you have to really understand sometimes. You know, when somebody says, should you give up praying? Well, sometimes if the prayer is unrealistic, yes, of course. If I'm still praying, God, I want to pitch the seventh game of the World Series one day, that's a stupid prayer. You know, that, that, that ended 40 years ago. Matter of fact, it never started. You know, well, I mean, that, you know, oh, God, I need you know, a Cadillac to really fulfill you. No, it, it, no, God's not going to answer that stuff. I'll tell you right now, he's not. Not for my life. But things I really need. Keep pressing in. You know, what, what, what are, your, what are your, your three loaves? And ask that with, with the Lord. <clears throat> you know, again, it's just exactly what I just said uh, as I prayed. I mean, as I, as I read. That's the scripture verses. <clears throat> Isn't that what he said? Give us today our daily bread. Lord, I need these three loaves in my life. Uh, this is something I've learned. I mean, these teachings, as again, I've been teaching not this particular thing word for word, but you know, I've been teaching on this topic for many, many years. And I've never, and this is something God gave me a long time ago when I read this before, and I've always had this in the back of my mind. You know, it's more than three loaves now, the ministry I have, but I'm always con you know, constantly thinking, God, what are those three things I need, God? What are the three loaves I need? But I'm not going to let you go unless you answer it. I'm going to keep on knocking until you answer these things. You know, I, I once met a guy, he said, you know, and he wasn't a minister in a sense, he was a believer, but he said, you know, he said he was, he was saved for 50 years. He only prayed for two people his whole life. And God answered his prayer. When he was first saved, he prayed for one friend, and almost within a week, his friend got saved. He kept praying, and 50 years later, his other friend got saved. But he kept praying for his friends. He wanted his two friends to get saved. And he kept praying for his friends. If you have unsaved loved ones, I do. I, I pray for them all the time. You know, and I've been a Christian over 30 years now. I still pray for them. That God, you know, that's, that's one of my loaves. God, that the ones that I love get saved, come to know you. You know, no, no, never mind the health and the finances and the ministry and everything else and specific people. And those are just categories. And you can break them down into like about 50 different areas all three of those things I've just mentioned, and just press in. Keep on asking, it will be given. Keep on seeking, it will be found. Keep on knocking, it will be opened. 
And that's just, I believe, it's a word today, it's a teaching today, but I think it's also a prophetic word for all of us today. That God wants you to keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, and God will open those doors for you. So I want to talk about <clears throat> now, in the time left, we, we, have, we have time here. And this is not exhaustive in any way, shape, or form. There are books this big, many of them, on this topic alone. I'm going to try to break it down just, just into four uh, small, bite-sized little things to hold on to. Because, I, like I said before, the needs we have in our lives, let alone the needs we have in this country right now, and even in the world, the, the um, need for intercession right now, <clears throat> intercession, I think, is a form of supplication. And this is when it broke down before. And I put these kind of two together. I could do a whole thing of supplication, but then again, I'll be repeating myself in some aspects talking about intercession. It is praying for, deeply praying for, for, you, for your needs. Supplication, when you supplicate, you're doing that more or less for yourself. You're supplicating. Yeah, God, I need this. And I just talked the last 15 minutes on that, the things that my three loaves. And intercession is very similar to that, except you're doing it for someone else, for something else. It's the same thing. I, God, I, there's a need that I see in right now. And God, you've put me in this place to be mindful of that, and I'm going to pray it through. Intercession is a meeting between... Uh, it's, it's, it, it, uh, it's, it's meeting God. Intercession basically means meeting between. Standing in the gap, basically. Standing in the way. So you have something going on here, you have God here, and you are the intercessor in between. You're the one that's going to pray for that particular thing going on to God. You're going to plead to God what's going on here. You're the person standing, you're feeling at, you know, you're standing in the gap, as it were. Very similar, and I'll give you some scripture verses at the end of this, this um, uh, session. But when, when Abraham stood, stood in the gap for Sodom and Gomorrah, God was going to bring judgment. He stood in the gap. He talked to God face to face. Lord, you, you, please don't do that. If there's 50 people, would you do it? No, I would not. If there's 45, I will not. If there's 40, I will not. He breaks it down. Up until 10, if there's 10 righteous people, will you send judgment? No, I will not. He stood in the gap. He pleaded for Sodom. Of course, there's eight righteous people there. He stopped the 10. And Abraham went after he said 10, God will not send judgment. But he stood in the gap. And it's a meeting place. Intercession is a, pla is, a, is, a, is a meeting place. And this is, I believe, every church. And again, I, I've heard very little, I've heard sometimes this word thrown around in churches, but not really taught on this. And this is probably one of the, the most important ministries in the church right now, the ministry of intercession, of people who just stand in the gap and begin to pray. Pray for the church itself, or pray for the pastors, pray for the um, people coming in, pray for the, the ministries, and stand in the gap and begin to intercede. It's a meeting place uh, to stand. As a matter of fact, it says, Abraham stood before God, is what it says. This is Genesis 18. Abraham stood before God, and he pleaded for Sodom. That's an intercessor. You stand before God, and you, and you plead. To, like, you know, <clears throat> that's, that's what priests do. You know, prophets speak from God to the people. A priest or an intercessor would speak from the people to God. You're, you're pleading God for the sake of others. That's what an intercessor does. Uh, intercession is praying for someone else or something beyond your own needs. If I could meet the needs, I would, but I can't. God, you have to do it. So I pray for, I pray, I pray for this particular person's situation, for this man, for this woman. It's emptying in oneself of yourself for the, for the sake of someone else, putting yourself in that place, esteeming one's, one's need greater than yourself, and you begin to pray for them. And it's, you know, this, this deals a lot with even the whole act of mercy and compassion. When you enter into another person's pain and you pray for that person as if you're praying for yourself. Parents do this all the time, friends. When our kids get sick, man, and, you know, Christian parents, and we believe in God, we're praying all the time for, I'd rather take the pain than have my son or my daughters have that pain. That's, that's in that way, it's a form of intercession. Lord, I'm praying to you for my child who cannot pray right now, or for my sick loved one or whatever. I'd rather take the pain myself, that I can't do that. Lord, you have to do that. So it's emptying yourself out for that sake. Um, again, we have this Jesus ministry, Philippians 2, 7. He made himself of no reputation 
taking the form of a bondservant and coming into the likeness of men. Um, Christ is, truly is our intercessor. That's what John 17 is all about. Um, Jesus is our high priest. He intercedes for us. He did meant much more than that as well. Uh, but truly he prayed for us. As a matter of fact, John 17, first he prays for himself. There's a supplication. Lord, restore to me the glory I had to you before the foundation of the world. And then immediately begins to pray for his disciples. I pray for them that I've entrusted your word to these men. And I pray, God, for the ones that come after them. Keep them from the evil one. He said that. Protect them. And then he said that to Peter in the upper room. I prayed for you, Peter. The devil has a desire to sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you. That's the intercessor. In the garden, he was supplicating. He was praying to God, give me the strength to go what I have to go through. But intermingled with that, he was interceding for the disciples. And when you're restored, Peter, strengthen my lambs. So I'm interceding for you. He made himself no reputation. He came as a, a priest. Ephesians 5, 18. Do not be drunk in wine, which is dissip uh, dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And then we learn from Luke 11, when we begin to pray and intercede for God and cry out to God, he will give us the Holy Spirit. And be drunk in the Holy Spirit. and uh, Actually, be filled, actually, not drunk. That's the thing. There's one man who calls himself God's bartender, and he uses this, this particular phrase. Oh, I get drunk, yeah. But in my ministry, that's one word I don't usually use so much of people getting drunk um, in anything. But being filled, yes, absolutely. So look at intercession here. And again, I'm going to break this down in the time a lot in just four simple things. Like again, and this is not exhaustive. Believe me, this there's huge books on this and some powerful writings and powerful intercessors in, 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 in our ministry and our world today. But also, before I do that, it is a pleading, an intrigue. Praying for all men and all women. 1 Timothy 2, 1, 8. I'll just read some of this. I won't read the whole thing for sake of time. But it says, Therefore, I exhort first of all the supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made of all men. For kings or leaders... And all, who are, and all who are in authority. So no matter what, again, relating it back to our own situation right now, friends, we're in a mess here politically. Pray for the opposition of your own party as well to that. Pray for the leaders of that lead many, those who are in authority. And then also that we may lead quiet lives in peaceable, a peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. This is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. And the ultimate, he desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And here's the, the creed. There's one God and one mediator between God and man. Mediator, again, he's the intercessor. One man who stands between God and man. He's, he's, he's the mediator. He's the intercessor between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. So there's no doubt what, who, who Paul's talking about. Who gave himself up for a ransom to be, uh, to be, uh, to be testified in due time in which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I'm speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles and faith and truth. I desire, therefore, that men pray everywhere. Boy, let this teaching be in the church. Let them pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath or doubting. You know, this is where, this is where it's at. And this is right from Paul. This is leading into that the first part, the first two verses there that supplications and intercessions be made for everyone, the highest and the lowest of the land. Um, good thing to meditate on. Intercession is a battle. Forget the number seven, that goes with a different teaching, but I've kind of put all these things together, I've got a composite here. Uh, intercession is a battle. And boy, is it ever. You're standing in the gap. You're wrestling. So I want to give just four elements of intercession in the time remaining here. And again, there are many, many more just for our time here and for the, the purpose of this, this particular seminar and seminars we're doing. I'll just give you four um, elements of intercession that we can take home with us and hopefully that you can pray through during the week and, and, and times to come too as well. So it's just not in this, in this time. So one thing about intercession is a position of power as an intercessor. Abraham, he had that authority 
He knew that authority. He stood before God. When Paul is praying for this, he had, he had an apostolic authority to command the church, not to just to encourage the church, but he was commanding the church. As, as an apostle, this is what I'm telling the church to do, to make all prayers. You know, as a pastor, we can do that. Um, as a parent, you can do that to your children. Make sure you say your prayers and, you know, but have that position of, of um, authority. But look at 2 Corinthians 5.20. It's right here. Now that we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Now, that doesn't so, talk so much about prayer so much, but an ambassador has authority. As a matter of fact, he is or she is the highest authority of that particular country they are sent from in the foreign land. They are the representation of that country they represent. We represent a country not on earth, by the heavenly kingdom. Christ has filled us with his uh, spirit and with the authority of an ambassador to speak his word in preaching the word, to, they can be reconciled with God, but also in prayer, I have the authority to use his word as, as a defense and an offense. I have the authority to do that as an ambassador. Interesting enough, just um, recently I, I've been, had a, a unique opportunity. I was doing some acting, but I was asked to play actually one of the, the, the first ambassadors of the United States in a special meeting for the ambassador, the, the, the present ambassador of the United States here in London. It was a special meeting. It was the 230th anniversary of the State Department. It had a special thing, and they wanted Ben Franklin to show up. So they called the Franklin House. And so they said, could we have a Ben Franklin at this, at this particular thing? So they've actually, they get contacted me. Could I portray Ben Franklin? I said, I would love to. And so I prepared. I studied my, my thing. I did the stuff. But as I was there, and I was, I was preparing for as an actor to, to do this, and it was a 90-minute gala, all improv. It was like just be there, and all the press were there, there's, the parliamentarians were there, and the ambassador, Woody Johnson, was there as well. Ambassador Johnson was there, who greeted me, Dr. Franklin. And I, I, forgot, I forgot the wig, I, forgot, I was like Ben Franklin. But as I was preparing it, I, was, I, I began to understand the weight of the character I was playing. He is an ambassador. And Franklin was the very first ambassador of, of the United States. Back in 1776, he was sent out to France as the ambassador of the United States, speaking to the present ambassador. And knowing his weight, and, I mean, you know, he, he is the representation of the nation of the United States standing in front of me, welcoming me in this thing. And I understood that. And I cracked a joke with him, one ambassador to another, and this and that, and blah, blah, blah. But it really gave me a sense of understanding this particular thing. Our words have weight, a lot of weight. You may not think so, but they do. You say, no, I'm, I just believe in Jesus and, you know, I just, you know, I thank God and I say my prayers at night. And friend, you are an ambassador. That's a position of power. We represent a nation, not on this earth, but we, we as Jesus came down representing heaven, he left. He says, I give you all authority as an ambassador. Use that authority in prayer. You have the right to use the scripture. You have the right to go bold, to bold, go boldly into his, uh, his throne room. You know, Jesus sent us to do the work that we are doing. And what is that work? That work, friends, is intercession. It's many other things. It's leading people to Christ. It's, leading, it's living a holy life, letting your light shine before men. But all this, friends, is undergirded by the fact that it's a life of prayer that does it. You know, I, I, I look upon... A lot of the work I do, and I'm so helpless. You know, this, you know, we only have two hands and two feet, and we get a bunch of people together. We get, if we have five people, then we have 10 hands and 10 feet, and that's about it. Very limited in finances, very limited in, in resources. And yet, as intercessors, though, we can crack heaven and ask God to come down and do stuff that we can't even think or imagine. And friends, we have the authority as intercessor to do that, to, to protect. And God speaks through us, and he prays through us. You know, the, the line in the scripture verse in Romans 8, the Holy Spirit praying through us. Uh, friends, you can just go over that just quickly. It came to my mind right now that Romans 8, and um, many people misinterpret this. A lot of charismatics misinterpret this. They speak, he's talking about speaking in tongues. He's not. Uh, 
Uh, it's, 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 it's worse, deeper than even words. The, the groaning of the Spirit. Uh, Romans 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. And I just said that. We are so weak, but we have, we have authority as ambassadors. For we do not know what to pray for, pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. He who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Wow. The Spirit intercedes for us and then also helps us to intercede for others. And you can't put this on an overhead or a whiteboard, friends. This is deep in the Spirit. The Spirit works in your life. Every one of us who has the Holy Spirit within them, that the Spirit is at work in us. And that's an authoritative spirit. He has authority. And that's the second thing. We have authority. We are ambassadors. That's our title. And friends, you did not earn it. It comes with the turf of being a possessor of the Holy Spirit, of being a Christian. It comes with the turf. That's one of the titles. You are an ambassador. Similarly, you know, you are the light of the world. It takes a lot of authority. So let your light shine before men. But we have authority. And 1 John 4, 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Don't think just because you're, you're facing a giant that God won't answer your prayer. Matter of fact, God dwells within the realm of the impossible. That's awesome, man. Well, I put something on the, um, I can't, <laughs> and it, it, I love this gentleman so much. He's just a beautiful guy. Um, he needs a lot of sanctification, but I love him nevertheless, man. He's just beautiful. But he comes to church with the walls all the time. And um, he professes a love for Christ. He comes, he responds to the preaching all the time. He needs still some deliverance. I'm going to mention his name, obviously. But he had this one testimony that he just took authority, and he was diagnosed with a very severe brain hemorrhage. And they said, they're going to have to go into a skull and do stuff. And he just freaked out. He says, you're not tapping my skull. I'm out of here. Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. He ran out of the hospital, praying, God, help, heal me, heal me. Help me, Jesus. Help me. The cops found him. They brought him back. And he said, this man's sick. Go get him. So he, the cops you know, grabbed him, brought him back to the, the um, hospital. They took another scan, and they found absolutely nothing. And he's absolutely blown away. He goes, who am I? He goes, I, I, I'm a sinner. That's just the way I am. But I love Jesus. I called upon Jesus. And, but he had the authority. He believed. Of all those things, he's been coming to the church of the walls for years. I said, man, the penny dropped, man. That you have, we have authority to supplicate. In that case, he was supplicating for himself. But he could have done that to anybody. God, heal this man. And he was desperate. Again, that urgency, the boldness was there. I need you. The same urgency we have, friends, the authority we have in praying for others. You know, when Jacob said he held on to the one he was wrestling with, this angel, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. But that's another way of having that urgency and the authority. I'm holding on. We come with authority. We come in his authority. We need to go and get our orders, friends. You know, I use, forgive me for slipping my metaphors back and forth there. We're also soldiers. We're, doing, we're in warfare right now. Great is he that's in you. We have a world that's dying around us. People who are suffering around us. Family members who are suffering. Lord, Holy Spirit, teach me how to know how to pray. Then my prayers are going to be answered for my particular friends, loved ones, Church, nation, community. We need to go and get our orders. Lord, Holy Spirit, what, what today, what three loaves are you giving me today, Lord, that you want me to pray for? It goes beyond just praying for myself. I'll do that. I'll supplicate myself. It says that Job sanctified him, himself and his family every day. He was a righteous man. So he prayed for himself and his family every day. And we should do that the same. We intercede for our 
yes, ourselves and what we need, supplicate, but then he also intercedes for our family. I said this is a battle, friends. The moment you bend your knee, metaphysically, or, or me metaphorically, or even practically, when you do it, when you bend your knee, you're doing warfare. If the devil can stop you praying, friends, he can stop your ministry. He can stop you praying, he can stop you believing. James 4, 7. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Matter of fact, if you go to James, I don't have it written all the way down. Look at the whole context of that. Look at James. I love this book. Book of James. Book of James, chapter 7. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. I mean, that's a straight didactic teaching, friends. There's nothing metaphorical about that. Resist the devil. He will flee from you. Which is the first level. If, you, if, you, if I was teaching on any aspect of deliverance, this is the first aspect of deliverance, of getting set free from any satanic stronghold. First of all, you, you're doing warfare and you're resisting the devil. He will flee from you. Draw near to God. That's the second point. Resist it. You can't say no to something without saying yes to something else. There's no good saying no to the devil and then just leaving it like that because the devil's an outlaw anyway. You say, get lost, man. I'm coming back. I'm staying. But if you start drawing near to God, it makes things very more, much more uncomfortable for Satan to hang around on that level. You, draw, you resist the devil, but you draw near to God. You say no to him, say yes to God. And he will draw near to you. He will listen to you. Speak what you need and you will be answered. Ask. See, this, this goes with the asking and knocking and seeking. Resist the devil, draw near to God. You have his ear. Turn off things in your life that are going to distract you, that you know will distract you when you need to get in that place with God to pray. If it means turning off your phone, then man, by all means, do it. Getting alone, maybe sometimes taking a drive. I know when I was um, younger and the boys were younger and stuff and you know, there's mo much more commotion in my house, I literally would get, just get in my car and go to the park and pray. That was, that was my prayer closet because that was a place that was quiet. I could just go early in the morning and do it and just, just find a place to get close to God and he'll get close to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before God and he will exalt you. And that's what I mentioned before. It's a battle, friends, and you draw near to God. No one's going to touch you when you're clothed with that armor of God around you. As a matter of fact, go to Ephesians. As I'm speaking right now, Ephesians, just go back about maybe 10 pages. You know, you talk about the armor of God. This is the position as, as intercessors, praying. And I won't go through the whole armor of God. You can look that up. It's um, Ephesians 6, verse 10. It says, to stand. Standing before the Lord. When you've done everything, to stand. I will not give up ground. But if you look at the armor of God here, it goes all the way through in verse 17, the last of the armor of God, just as in take up the helmet of the salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. He talks about the helmet, the sword, the shield, the breastplate, uh, the belt of truth, the sand of the peace, all that. And verse 18, after you clothe the armor of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayers and supplication. This is, friends, this is the position of the intercessor. Clothe yourself with the armor of God, Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. And then when you're clothed, it says them praying all the time. That's how we pray, friends. We understand our righteousness is in Christ. The truth is Christ. The peace is from Christ. Half the armor is already on you. You have that by Christ. Then the intercessor does picks up the other three aspects. He girds his mind for action, the helmet of salvation. He takes up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, using the Word of God 
offensively and defensively, and the sword and the shield, which is faith, I know. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. So the last three of the armor, we pick up ourselves. The first three, Christ is clothed, clothed with that. But the result is that we can pray at all times. And he even goes on to say, pray for me. Well, wow. verse 19, also pray for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly. Wow. We're in a battle, friends. Only after submitting ourselves to God are we in a place to fight or to intercede for others. I've seen so many intercessors get, the devil wipes the floor with them because they go in almost flippantly. No one, no, 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 no country, no, no trained warrior or soldier would ever go into a battle without having some understanding of warfare, understanding of the armament that he carries, whether it's in the primitive times of rocks and stones to medieval times of bows and arrows to modern times of guns and, and missiles, you, you know, and plus knowing your enemy. We learn that through prayer. We learn it through the word. As an intercessor, it's a battle. And the devil, we have a friend of ours and he says, you know, the devil knows your cheese. In other words, he, just, he knows everything about you, man. He knows which buttons to push. So you're interceding, he'll just come back. With, and if he can't attack you this way, he'll try to go around the other way. Gird your mind for action. It's a battle. Resist him. Focus on God. Nothing was going to move Abraham. when He stood before God interceding for a city which also had his family in it. Lord, and he would not go, even breaking up from 50 people down to 10 people. Nothing was going to take him from that position. His mind was fixed. Resisting the devil. And the last thing, friends, here is, is again, these are just very quickly, but four things to keep in mind as you begin to pray and intercede for others. We have access to him. Boy, Give me another, and I say this in the truest positive sense, give me another religion that its believers have access to God. Well, forget about the, the ones that are not monotheistic, the one God beliefs. Those, you know, Hindus have a thousand gods, forget that. Buddhism is a philosophy, I mean, Jainism and all this other isms, and forget it. Islam, monotheistic, they, they can't go and turn into Allah. Jews do not. They, they can pray to him. Friends, as believers in Christ, through Jesus Christ, we have access to the throne of grace. What a privilege that is, a privileged position of being born again. Go to Ephesians 2. You're in Ephesians now. Just go to chapter 2. Look at verse 18. I love this. Verse 18. There's no way in other religions that have this, friend, and no other belief system. This is the truth of God. Verse 18, chapter 2. Through him, meaning Christ, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. We have access to the Father. We can call him Abba Father. Nowhere, friends. We talked about this last week. Yes, we, we go to the Father and say, Oh, Father. Yes, there were some scripture verses in the Old Testament where God is referred to Father. Very few, by the way. But that wasn't a common practice in Judaism to call God Father. In our belief system, it is absolutely essential. Father. We have access. And look at Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. This is the one I've quoted before, and I've been quoting it um, quite a bit. Because this is one of my life verses. I need this verse so much. My own life. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. 
Friends, that's a card blanche any time, any day, any hour. Go to the throne of grace. The example, of course, is found in the book of, of Esther, where she went under the fear of death into the throne room. Her husband was her husband was a husband, so he has an intimacy, but oh no, her husband first was the king. No one, no one goes into the king unless you're invited. She went in. And unless the king held out his golden scepter, she was dead. And that means a favor. It means forgiveness. In that sense, acceptance. Well, when Esther came in, the king held out the scepter and she was welcomed and she could petition on behalf of her people. For such a time as this, you may know the story. Friends, we go into the throne of grace now. The scepter is laid out. Christ is saying, yes, I accept you. What is on your heart? What is on your, your mind? My wife, we are the bride. Tell me. She found favor with her king and her husband. Christ is our king and our husband. We have access to him. We have the right to go into the throne of grace through Jesus Christ. And, you know, it's a privilege, friends, but it's also a right. Go boldly into the throne of grace. There's a wonderful picture. It's a, I don't want to weaken this a little bit, but being an American, it's always just like this whole the Americana thing. When John Kennedy was first elected, and for, for the first time ever, they have, you know, he's there by, he's, he's in the Oval Office, and there's a little John John playing under the table, and the kids are there. And, and you know, it's, who would have thought of it? The kids are playing in the Oval Office. It's the President of the United States. These are my kids. Come on in, kids. And the kids are playing, and it shows little John John crawling underneath the table of the President's office while he's talking to some senator or something, or something. But it's a, a very cute picture. But in a way, friends, we, we were his kids, we were his ambassadors. There's so many biblical metaphors and titles that we truly possess. We can go boldly into his throne, throne room. And Jesus works always interceding for us. Romans 8.34, he, who then condemns us? It is Christ who died, and furthermore he is risen. Even who at the right hand of God, who makes intercession for us. Friends, I don't believe that Jesus is at, in the throne right now on his knees praying that, oh, I pray that Kurt really get through with this. And blah. His intercession for us, friends, was in the Garden of Gethsemane. That's, that's my theology now. He prayed for those that were going to take over the message and those who come after them. His intercessions are still going on today. His prayers are still being answered in you tonight. Would he pray for those that would come after those who he would entrust the message to? in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and now to the ends of the earth, even in Upminster. Christ still, this, the power of his intercession is still alive today, going around the world, undergirding us, filling us. Hebrews 7, 25, Therefore he is also able to save to the utmost those who come to him through him, since he always lives and makes intercession for them. He's alive, and what he speaks is alive they are the word of God enshrined in holy writ. When he prayed in John 17, I pray for those who come after these 11 that I entrust the gospel to, that you have given me, Father. We have that authority, friends. And as priests, and you are a priest, and a priest, again, a prophet speaks to, from God to the people. A priest speaks from the people to God. We're intercessors as being a priest. And friends, you are of a holy priesthood. Talks about the body of Christ. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation of his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called him out of the darkness and into his marvelous light. We are children of the light. We let a light shine before an ungodly world as ambassadors, as those who have authority, every one of us here, we have authority. Not given by the church here, not given by the Church of England or uh, independent churches or the Catholic Church. No, by God. By His Word. He's given you authority to pray to Him, to be clothed by Him, 
Man does not give this authority, friends. God has given the authority. He's given me the privilege, but also the responsibility to pray. You the responsibility to pray, to intercede. The time is up right now. We're going to continue this next week. And, but I want, I want to encourage you, friends. I really want to encourage you just to, to see your position before God. Maybe you've never seen yourself in this position before. And we're taught, and I have to admit, we're taught in, in, our, in, our, in our traditions of always go maybe to the pastor or to somebody else to have them pray for you. And, and that's good. We should. But also, friends, you're also an intercessor, every one of us, on, on, on that level. And I, I, I make the case, every, every parent who's a believer in Christ is an intercessor. How many times do you pray for your kids? It's the same principle. Now just expand it into the body of Christ, to your neighbors. Amen?